In a separate reality in Chapter 1, Carlos and Don Juan were sitting at a park bench in a small town in central Mexico. They were waiting for a friend of Don Juan's, and toward the end of their conversation, Carlos related how his car had broke down. While staying in town for three days to get it repaired, he had witnessed a group of quite orderly street boys seeking to shine the shoes of people eating outside at the hotel's restaurant. When refused, they didn't insist and went back to the curb. When three men in business suits got up and left, they ran to the table and devoured the plates of leftovers in seconds, lemon peels and all. After three days of watching them go like vultures after the most meager of leftovers, I became truly despondent, and I left that city feeling like there was no hope for those children whose world was already molded by their day-to-day -day struggle for crumbs. Do you feel sorry for them? Don Juan exclaimed in a questioning tone. I certainly do, I said. Why? Because I'm concerned with the well-being of my fellow men. Those children and their world is ugly and cheap. Wait, wait. How can you say their world is ugly and cheap? Don Juan said, mocking my statement. You think that you're better off, don't you? I said I did, and he asked me why. I told him that in comparison to those children's world, mine was indefinitely more varied and rich in experiences and in opportunities for personal satisfaction and development. Don Juan's laughter was friendly and genuine. He said that I was not careful with what I was saying, that I had no way of knowing about the richness and the opportunities in the world of those children. I thought Don Juan was being stubborn. I really thought he was taking the opposite view just to annoy me. I sincerely believe that those children did not have the slightest chance for any intellectual growth. I argued my point for a while longer, and then Don Juan asked me bluntly, didn't you once tell me that in your opinion, man's greatest accomplishment was to be a man of knowledge? I had said that, and I repeated again that in my opinion, to become a man of knowledge was one of the greatest intellectual accomplishments. Do you think that your very rich world would ever help you become a man of knowledge? Don Juan asked with slight sarcasm. I did not answer, and then he worded the same question in a different manner, a thing I always do to him when I think he does not understand. In other words, he said, smiling broadly, obviously aware that I was cognizant of his ploy, can your freedom and opportunities help you become a man of knowledge? No, I said emphatically. Then how could you feel sorry for those children, he said seriously. Any one of them could become a man of knowledge. All the men of knowledge I know were kids like those you saw eating leftovers and licking the tables. Don Juan's argument gave me an uncomfortable sensation. I had not felt sorry for those underprivileged children because they did not have enough to eat, but because in my terms their world had already condemned them to be intellectually inadequate. And yet, in Don Juan's terms, any one of them could have achieved what I believed to be the epitome of man's intellectual accomplishment, the goal of becoming a man of knowledge. My reason for pitying them was incongruous. Don Juan had nailed me neatly. Perhaps you're right, I said. But how can one avoid the desire, the genuine desire, to help our fellow men? How do you think one can help them? By alleviating their burden. The least one can do for our fellow men is to try to change them. You yourself are involved in doing that, aren't you? No, I'm not. I don't know what to change or why to change anything in my fellow men. What about me, Don Juan? Weren't you teaching me so I could change? No, I'm not trying to change you. It may happen that one day you may become a man of knowledge. There's no way to know that. But that will not change you. Someday, perhaps, you'll be able to see men in another mode, and then you'll realize there's no way to change anything about them. What's this other mode of seeing men, Don Juan? Men look different when you see. The little smoke will help you see men as fibers of light. Fibers of light? Yes, fibers, like cobwebs very fine threads that circulate from the head to the navel. Thus, a man looks like an egg of circulating fibers, and his arms and legs are like luminous bristles bursting out in all directions. Is that the way everyone looks? Everyone. Besides, every man is in touch with everything else, not through his hands, though, but through a bunch of long fibers that shoot out from the center of his abdomen. Those fibers join a man to his surroundings. They keep his balance. They give him stability. So as you may see someday, a man is a luminous egg, whether he's a beggar or a king, and there's no way to change anything, or rather, what could be changed in that luminous egg. What? 